Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, we have Michael Haig. He's founder of StoryMastery.com. He's one of the top story experts for Hollywood writers, filmmakers, studios, as well as public speakers, marketers, and business leaders. He's coached producers and stars for the past 35 years. You don't look that old. On such projects as I Am Legend, Hancock, The Karate Kid for Will Smith and Overbrook Entertainment, Masters of the Universe for Columbia Pictures, and he worked on projects for Julia Roberts, Morgan Friedman, and many more. Michael is the best-selling author of Selling Your Story in 60 Seconds, and the book, Writing Screenplays That Sell. And Michael, I have to tell you, when I heard about you, I immediately bought every book I can find on Audible, listened to it several times because stories that elicit emotion is really essential to everything we do in business and life, and you are an expert. So thank you so much for joining me. Oh, no, thank you for having me. I'm honored and excited about doing this. So, and thanks for buying my books. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, they're well worth it, and everyone should check them out for sure. And the first, you know, when I reading your books, you do a good job kind of going over some overarching things that people should think about. And one of them is eliciting more emotion. And can you give an example when you help transform someone's work to help their, their story elicit more emotion? Yeah, well, just speaking generically, yeah. uh, first of all, the the num you have to elicit emotion because the thing that makes a story great or even effective is the listener or the reader, the audience, whoever it might be, they want to participate in the story. They just don't want to feel like they're observing what's on the movie screen or just listening to facts or, or relating something. They want to become a part of it. They want to have an emotional experience. That's why we get involved with stories, so we can feel something, not just so we can learn something or think about something. So that's what makes it so essential. When you can elicit emotion, you create a better connection with the people you're speaking to or writing for. Or, and you, out of that emotion, you can do those other things. You can move them to action. You can change their beliefs, whatever. But they have to feel. But the most important thing to understand about how you do that is emotion grows out of conflict. That it's the obstacles the characters in the story, particularly the protagonist or the hero of the story, faces. It's the obstacles they face that create the emotional moments in the story. Uh, if you were to think about, if, if I ask anyone in the audience, tell me your favorite movie, and then tell me some parts of it you remember, tell me some of your favorite scenes and moments, chances are that nine out of the ten of those favorite moments would be either scenes of great conflict, a battle between robots and humans or aliens or whatever, or the anticipation of conflict, if it's like a suspense thriller mm -hmm. or the anticipation of what could go wrong in a love story or whatever it might be. So that's why, uh, that's how emotion is primarily elicited. And so when someone's telling a story, then one of the first things to ask is what makes whatever this character wants impossible to get? because if it's easy to get, we're not involved. It's like, okay, you wanted it, you got it, so what? It's we want to know about those obstacles that have to be overcome or had to be overcome if you're relating a, a story from the past. And as an example, this is just fresh in my mind because uh, yesterday I coached someone who's a marketer, an internet marketer, and he was telling a story, creating an analogy with the story, and he was telling a story about having – a beautiful woman on his arm, they went to a club, and how she was able to move right to the head of the line and get into the club immediately. And then he set up an analogy between that situation and the product he was selling, which in the internet world helped people get to the front of the line of whatever website was involved or whatever, mm -hmm. which was fine. It was, a, it was a nice story. It was a great analogy. But I said, what was missing from the story is any obstacles to overcome. And I said, I want to know how hard it was to get this beautiful woman to go out with you. I want to know how nervous you were. I want to know the moment when you saw this long line in front of the club and you thought, oh my God, I'm going to look like an idiot because we're going to have to wait in this long line so that 
we're more and more involved with the hero who's facing the situation, wondering how is he going to overcome these problems. Mm -hmm. And then finally she's able to get in and the problem is solved. Yeah. So you introduced more, more conflict, more obstacles and some of the backstory. Yeah. You want to make life as hard as you can for the hero of your story. And that's what that's what Hollywood knows very well. I yeah. mean, that's that's why Hollywood is so successful. Because if you think about any successful Hollywood movie, it's filled with conflict. Yeah, yeah. And so, Mike, I want to talk about the um, you know the principles that apply to marketers. But first, I have to hear how do you work with writers and filmmakers on their screenplays? Uh, sure. Um, what. I consider myself more than anything a coach. That's kind of how I label myself uh, and have for about the last 20 of those 35 years I've been working. When I started out, I more did what a lot of consultants do, and that is just give notes is the term. In Hollywood, I would just say, this works, this doesn't, do this, do this, change this, change this. But when I really, when my practice, if you will, or my process really transformed is when I started asking more questions. So the first thing I always do when I have my first coaching session with a screenwriter, let's say, or a filmmaker or a group of filmmakers at the studio or whatever it might be, when we're dealing with a project, I always start by asking a lot of questions because what I need to find out is how does this writer or this filmmaker see their project? I need to know what their vision is for the movie, because if I don't know that, then I'm just sort of saying, well, my vision of your screenplay is this, and I think you should do this. Mm. What's much more effective and helpful and also gets a much better reception from the creative person is by asking questions I get at. What do you want this to be? Now let's close the gap between what's on the page right now and how what you see happening mm -hmm. on the screen or what effect you want to have on the audience for your story. And then also out of those questions, which I have now discovered is a great way to approach anything in life, anytime you're dealing with somebody, questions are just so valuable because by asking questions about their script, which I've already read, then they get very clearly, hey, he really looked at my screenplay. He really is on my side. He wants me to help, wants to help me be as good as I can possibly be and make the movie as good as it can possibly be. And then as we move forward, as the, I hear the answers, then I start pointing out, well, okay, I see that you want this character to be this way, then why does this character do this on page 24? Mm -hmm. Or why did you introduce the character this way? Or if this is the arc the character is going to go through, why are they already courageous at the beginning of the story instead of fearful so they can become courageous? And then eventually I start saying, you should do this, this, and this, just like I always have. But the recommendations grow out of what the person wants their own movie to be. Is it common? <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, is it common when you ask that question that people know exactly, or do you kind of have to work them through it? Well, it, it depends. The, the questions start out very general, and there's no right answer. Like, uh, one of my favorite first questions is to take a character who's not the hero of the story and say, tell me about this person. Do you like this person? I said, I don't mean do you like this character? Do, do, I, do you think this is a well-drawn character? I mean, if this person were a real person in real life, would you hang out with them? Mm -hmm. Would you want to be with them? Do you respect them? Do you admire them? Do What is it? And oftentimes they'll say, well, yeah, by the end of the movie, I really like them. And I said, no, I'm talking about when you first introduce them. Is this somebody you'd hang with? And they said, no, not really. And then I usually follow it by saying, then why is an audience going to want to spend two hours rooting for this character? Yeah. Or it might be not that bad not blatant, but it might just be, okay, well, if this, if you see the character as having this struggle, then look at how you could emphasize that more clearly when the character is introduced or whatever. So they aren't question. It's not like a multiple choice, yes or no test. It's just actually the questions are almost irrelevant what they are. What I'm really trying to do is get the person talking. Right. I'm just trying to get my client talking about what they're, 
doing or, or because good things come out of whatever they say. And even if they say, gee, I don't know, a lot of good things could come out of that answer because right. then they realize, wait a minute, I, you know, that I, I really need to think about this character more, don't I? And then they figure it out themselves and I don't have to say, you have to think about this character. And, and, and since I've branched out and I'm working with people in other arenas, the same process is just excellent. I mean, since we're talking to a group of entrepreneurs, one piece of advice I would have is just never underestimate the power of questions rather than advice or criticism. You can get to the advice and criticism, but if you start out just saying, talk to me about what's going on with you or tell me what you're trying to do here. And out of that can grow whatever wisdom you can give the person or guidance. I think it's much stronger and taken much more deeply by the person you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And so I was watching a talk that you gave online and uh, you mentioned that you have a good Will Smith story. Um, well, <laughs> what, what, what a setup. Gee, I hope it's a good story. I think what I was referring to is how I met Will Smith. Okay. Because, because it was, it was, it's a, it's a, it was, it was one of those moments like since I moved to Hollywood almost 40 years ago, it still remains one of the most magical times I ever had, one of the most magical days. What happened was I, this was now some years ago, maybe five or six years ago, and I was working with, I've been a, a story and script consultant for a long time, and I, um, you know, I was doing well, but kind of some, I was in one of those moods where I felt like, well, all the cool people are on the inside of the circle and I'm on the outside of the circle when it comes to Hollywood. And then the phone rings and the person says, hi, my name's Tracy. I work with Will Smith. And I said, you mean Will Smith, Will Smith? And she said, yeah, that's the one. Will wants to know if you would be willing to take a look at a screenplay. He's finishing a movie called I Am Legend. They're struggling sort of with the ending of it. And he'd like you to take a look and see what you might have to suggest. And so I said, yeah, I think I can find the time. <laughs> so <laughs> I send the script and I take a look and I write out my comments and my suggestions and my reaction to the script. I send it off and I thought that was just so neat. I go in and said to my wife, Vicki, you know, how cool is that? I just expressed some opinions and the biggest movie star in the world might pay attention to them. I thought that was it until three days later, I get a call. Hi, this is Tracy. Will wants to know if you'd be willing to talk to him about some of the suggestions you made. <laughs> so I said, OK, I think I can find the time. <laughs> and so I said, uh, I need to ask you, how does he know about me specifically? Do you read my book? And she said, yeah, I know he's read your book, but I think the thing most was the video that you saw, The Hero's Two Journeys, the seminar that I did with Chris Vogler, and yeah. he said that. So I said, sure. So they set up a call, and they call and say, okay, we've got Will, and Will gets on the phone, and I said to him, Okay, look, I said, I know we're going to talk about the script, but you got to let me do the fan thing first. And he said, okay. And I said, first, I want to tell you that I think that the performance you gave, there's a moment at the end of Pursuit of Happiness where you find out about the job that you've been waiting to hear about for so long. I said, I think that moment should be used in every acting school in the world about how you underplay a scene. And he said, well, thanks. He said, you know, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to do that movie is so I could play that very scene. So mm. I thought, hey, cool. Really? I think I impressed him with that comment. Wow. And then I said, the other thing I should tell you is one of my favorite movies is Hitch and one of my all-time favorite romantic comedies. In fact, I said, I have used that movie frequently in seminars and lectures I've given about love stories and romantic comedies because it does such a superb job of following what I consider to be the, the key principles of creating a romantic comedy. And he said, well, I should probably tell you that the whole time we were developing that script, we kept asking ourselves, are we doing what Michael Haig said we should do wow. on his video and making sure these two people connect at the level of essence? And I thought, that's Scores. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And that was, I've never, I had never had the experience that I had been using a movie as an example that was a good example. They were using. Paid attention to what I had said. Right. 
And then out of that grew a relationship. I was on retainer for many years with his company, and yeah. that's when I, you know, worked with him on Karate Kid, and and got to work with him over a number of projects and with his company. So it's it was the start of a of a really neat relationship. Yeah, that's a great story. So what did you what do you mean by underplay for? In the pursuit of happiness. Uh, underplay, it's it's when an actor is doesn't project emotion, but holds the emotion and trusts that if they're totally experiencing it, the audience will get it. And so I I, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Pursuit of Happiness. If sure. you're not yeah, highly yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this is toward the end. He's been waiting, waiting, desperate to get a job. And then he's waiting to find out. And he finds out, I, I don't want to give away the ending, but mm -hmm. when he finds out what he learns, he is filled with emotion, but the character cannot allow himself to just break out into tears or whatever he might do. Mm. So you can see he's holding all that all that mm -hmm. feeling in, but we can see it kind of leak out. And to me that's that's outstanding acting. It's it's uh, it's the opposite of playing to the back back rows at a theater. Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember any of your initial thoughts on I Am Legend? Um I remember that whatever suggestions I made, they didn't pay attention to a single one, which was okay. He, he obviously appreciated them because then right. he asked me to give him feedback on Hancock and then they put me on retainer, so yeah. that was fine. But um, when I finally saw the movie, we were mainly talking about the ending because they'd been shooting the movie for months right. and just struggling with that. And when I finally saw the movie, the ending of the movie that you see now was not either of the endings we were they were trying to choose from when I talked to them. So now I don't know if maybe, maybe when they got my recommendations, they thought, well, it's clear from what this guy says, neither of these things are going to work, so we better come up with something new. Mm -hmm. And I never asked him. It was more just the experience of getting to yeah. give some feedback. Yeah, fantastic. So, and, you know, Michael, you um, wrote something also that, you tweeted out actually learn how to create speeches that will enthrall your audiences and move them toward real growth and transformation. And I think cause you were giving a, a talk at um, the champions edge summit. Can you tell me a little bit more about the creating speeches and enthralling audiences with stories? Now you didn't tell me you were going to ask me about my hype. I, I have to, jump I, li I like that copywriting that hyperbole. Yeah, I actually, inflated statements it, it caught my attention and uh so hopefully it catches people's attention with yeah. how they can improve their speeches so yeah okay well and since i since you read that or since i wrote that i've actually given that presentation and it seemed to go over well so that's yeah. it here's um uh, here's uh, i'll try and put in a nutshell what i was conveying that that a primary goal or need of a story, as I said, is to create an emotional experience. And then everything can grow out of that. But the most powerful stories of all are those that can hit, can affect your audience so deeply that they actually change or that it prompts them to, to leave the auditorium or leave the theater or close the page or shut their computer and go off and, and behave differently to truly change. And the way you do that the only way that I know of you can do that is to tell a story about a hero who actually transforms. Mm -hmm. Transformation is more than just they had a goal and then they went after it and they got it. Transformation means they had a goal, they wanted it, but they were so afraid that they weren't doing the things they needed to do to really achieve that. Mm -hmm. And because, as I said, stories are an emotional experience for the audience or for the reader, if you actually take your hero through that kind of journey, you give the audience the emotional experience of going through the same journey. So it's not that we're watching somebody be courageous. We are becoming courageous through that character. Mm -hmm. And my belief is it plants at least one more seed and encouragement to actually be courageous in our real lives. That's how we inspire people with story. So then, and then I talked about 
what exactly is it that stands in the way? What is that fear and where does that come from? And then when you understand that, you lay that into your your character because that's really what your audience is going to be battling with as well. Mm -hmm. So what is one of your favorite transformation stories, whether in TV or movies? Well... <laughs> Okay, if you if you start to, well, let, let me see. I have I'm gonna I'm afraid have several answers. To, let's <laughs> okay. start with movies. Yeah, yeah. It it's impossible to pick a favorite. Just like it's a, it's truly impossible for me to to pick a single favorite movie because almost all great movies are about transformation. Mm. The example I used in the speech I gave that I was promoting with that copy you just read mm -hmm. was Goodwill Hunting. Mm. And in Goodwill Hunting, you have a character who suffered a wound. That, that's my term for the pain in the past that's still affecting your behavior. His wound was he basically got beaten by his father with a belt all through his childhood and adolescence. And so out of that, he ad adopted a belief that he must have deserved it. He must be a worthless person because his father, who must know everything, you know, we have to believe our parents are right about everything right. to feel safe. So if his father beat him, he must have deserved it. And so his fear in that movie is really anybody seeing who he truly is because they'll see what a, a what a horrible worthless person he is and so then he meets this woman and falls in love with her yeah. but he can't really be with her because you can't have a fulfilling relationship with a person if you're going to hide behind this identity he's created of i'm a janitor i'm not smart doesn't let anybody know he's got a photographic memory and so on and so the story, what I call the inner journey in that, his transformation is from living in that identity to finally allowing himself to be vulnerable and living courageously. Mm -hmm. And the story is not only about his pursuit of the mini driver character, but how Sean, the Robin Williams psychiatrist, helps him find that courage. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a transformational story that is very strongly about transformation. It's such a great example of that wound, belief, fear, identity, and then moving into your essence uh, arc that I, I love it. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. I make this as an example all the time. Um, then you said about TV, though. Yeah. TV is a bit different. If you're talking about TV episodic series, because in most episodic series, unless they're just superficial action shows but in a lot of even comedies a character will also have a fear or an identity or something that that uh that is stopping them but they're never going to complete that arc they're never going to grow because if they complete the arc the series will be over mm. the humor comes out of whatever this flaw whatever this fear whatever this peccadillo is that they've developed as a result of these deep-seated fears so you still have the identity essence tug of war, but if it's ever going to be resolved, it's in the final episode. Like in Friends, finally he has the courage to really go after Rachel and she has the courage to be with him or whatever series you want to pick. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different in TV than feature films. Yeah. So favorite TV shows? Oh, God. <laughs> That's a yeah. It's it's getting harder because there's been so many good TV series lately. I I mean I love um, uh, what is it True Detective. I love Fargo. I loved uh, I love Game of Thrones and so on. Um, all time favorite TV series probably The West Wing, mm. and a very close second would be <laughs> Breaking Bad. Breaking Bad, yeah. Well, I. I'll I'll add one other thing about character arc. Occasionally you have stories that are tragedies. Uh, one of my all-time favorite movies is also a tragedy, and that's Godfather. Mm. And what I mean that's by that's on my list, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, and what I mean by tragedy is um, it's when a character has that same tug of war, and they never find the courage to actually change. Mm. And the thing that's true about both Wal Walter White and um, and Michael Corleone is no matter how much they may intellectually realize. I, I'm I'm entering I'm, I'm on a downward spiral. They never find the courage to really stand up for for 
who they could be or the truth of who they should be and they succumb to that fear. He just can't let go of the rush of the of being the meth dealer mm. and, and this burden to take care of his family. And interestingly in both stories, which are wildly different, um, the characters are both justifying what they do because they want to take care of their families. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think the dog likes that answer too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, Michael, I always like to include a fun fact. And we had to go to the deep depths and ask your wife about this. And uh, you came up with, which I thought was actually really interesting, is you never watch movie previews. No. Which I think no. for someone like you is strange. Why? Uh, yeah. I, and I, I'm kind of known for that because when I go to movies, either by myself or with people, as the previews come on, I always get up out of my seat and go out into the lobby or the hallway or whatever it is and wait until I hear the music come on that they're about to show the feature and then I go back and take my seat. And the reason is that uh, I never like to have any movie spoiled. I never like to know if possible what's going to happen in a movie because the first time I see it, I want to, I want to not just be surprised but I want to wonder what's going to happen next because that's part of the joy of seeing a movie. Yeah. It may be too extreme to say I never um, watch previews because if I've seen the movie, then I'll watch them to see, okay, how did they get people into the theater right. with this? But, um, excuse me one yeah, second. Yeah, go Okay. Just do it. <laughs> Dog's hungry. I think I finished. Yeah, you did. So the, the next thing I was going to ask about, Michael, was actually, you know, the two essential concepts and stories that you talk about, one, which you kind of alluded to in the beginning, which is elicit that emotion from someone. And the second one, which I would have never really thought of, is the finish line, the character pursuing the visible finish line. What mm -hmm. made you think about that in that specific way? Well, almost every thought I have <laughs> comes out of having watched so many movies my entire life and because I love movies so much and that's that's why I wanted to come to Hollywood and work in the film business and so on and then when I got involved in working with writers as a reading scripts and then working in development for for producers and then finally doing what I do now and consulting then I then over the years I've read thousands of screenplays as well and so almost every concept that I have grew out of looking at movies that are successful and asking what do they have in common? What made them consistent? How are they consistently successful for the same set of reasons right. beyond who's the star and, you know, what's what's the latest um, hype that they're giving it or whatever, like Fifty Shades of Grey, but what's making it successful based on the way the story is written and what isn't working with all of the screenplays I've read that aren't working, that aren't getting option, that aren't, there yeah. and so this was one of the things i realized early on and that is what hollywood understands and what i think we can all glean in storytelling regardless of the arena is it's stories are built on a foundation of character that's the hero and desire that character needs to want something. If, if it's just a slice of life, so to speak, if it's just here's the everyday life of a person, even if that person is, you know, a king or something, that's boring. What we want to see is a story that moves forward as the hero is desperate to accomplish some goal. But more specifically than that, in most Hollywood movies, that goal is very clearly visible. It's like a runner crossing a finish line. It's not just, I want to find love. It's not just, I want to be a success. It's not just, I want to be accepted. Those things are not really visible. It's, I want to stop a serial killer. <laughs> I want to escape from a serial killer. I want to stop an alien invasion. I want to win the love of a specific love interest character. Um, I want to take a magic ring from the Shire to Mount Doom to stop an evil force. It's 
the specific visible goal that really keeps us involved. And when anyone is telling a story, the more specific you can make that goal, the more involved we will be. So let's say you weren't writing a movie, you're writing a TV episode, you were telling a story where you're trying to sell a product, let's say, or, or trying to convince an audience that a certain process is a good way to accomplish something. Don't just say you'll be happier if you buy this. Don't even say you'll be rich if you buy this. Tell a story about someone who was desperate to raise $10,000 in a month so they didn't have their home foreclosed. Now we're going to be interested because now you have a very specific finish line. And obviously, I threw in a lot of conflict, the loss of one's home. And, and if you look at Hollywood movies, you will see that nine times out of 10, if it's a successful movie, or even if you just look at the movies you like, nine times out of 10, if they're made in Hollywood, they have that kind of finish line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I would have never thought of it like that. You know, that's that's what I liked about how you brought those overarching concepts. I mean, obviously, they're there. But if you know that, then it kind of brings it to your consciousness. You can kind of follow a, stru you know, look at a structure, right? Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons you wouldn't think about it, or most of us don't, most of the, well, I do because that's my job, right. but most of us don't, is because that's not what we talk about when we see a movie. You don't go out for coffee after a movie and just relate what the goal was. You don't say, yes, I like Silence of the Lambs because her goal was to stop Buffalo Bill the serial killer. There, there, there's no conversation there. There's nothing to say. Right. You're talking about what did it mean? How did the character change? What themes are going on? Do we we believe it or don't we believe it? How does it relate to real life? All of those things are more important in our conversations and our thought about the movie. Right. And if it gets to the level of theme, maybe more important about what the movie is trying to do. But none of those will work if you don't have that clear, visible outer motivation, I call it, that clear, visible goal that we can root for the hero to get to. Right. Everything else grows out of that. Yeah. So, Michael, I want to go back to you and because it made me think of when I'm when I was thinking about the visible finish line, I was thinking about you and what when you were young, what do you want to be when you grew up? Um, for I, I never I never like had that thing. I want to be a fireman. Not that I remember. I want to be a baseball player or something like that. I suppose it entered my mind when I was four or five or something like that. Uh, the only real wish I can remember going back as far as possible is I wanted to have something to do with the movies. I've loved the movies since the first movie I saw, which was probably, I was about, what, four or five. I think the first one I saw was The Robe my folks took me to. And uh, I just have, have always loved that. And uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, identity and so on, I never, ever said out loud for all the way through college, I never would say, I want to work in the movie business because that felt silly. I mean, nobody really? did that. I Why? always grew up and say, well, this way now, it, it might not be as silly now because, you know, show business permeates more of the consciousness around the world and around the country. But when I was growing up, it just, I, I think there were two reasons. One, it just felt like something you just don't, do that it's just it's not it, it wasn't even it's too hard or it's out of reach it's just that exists in a different universe so it would be kind of silly or you'd look kind of silly to say it and i think another reason was i didn't want anybody to step on that that desire mm. it wasn't it wasn't as formulated enough to say it was a goal i wasn't plotting and when i graduate i'm going to move to hollywood and then i'm going to get a job as an extra or whatever <laughs> wasn't anything like that it's just i'd love to have something to do with the movies but i think i didn't say it because i didn't want anybody including my my mother or my friends or anybody mm. else to have any opinion about it at all i didn't want it to be either encouraging or discouraging i just wanted it to be mine if that makes sense yeah and when i finally came this isn't exactly your question but when i finally came to hollywood um it wasn't like a big courageous earth-shaking decision i 
because I, you know, in real life, I think most of the time we're not heroes the way movie heroes are. In fact, even in movies, the hero doesn't make the big grand gesture right away. They have to sort of slowly get to the point where they can find that courage. Yeah. When I came to Hollywood, it was because I was living in Phoenix, working, not particularly enjoying my job there. And I was dating a woman who was entering a school in L.A., so she was moving. And so I thought, well, I'll go with you. <laughs> It was a love story. <laughs> yeah, well, not much of one. I, our relationship hardly lasted. The, the, the engine on the car was still warm when we broke up after. It was just, but it got me here. But it was like I had been saying I wanted this. Now I was saying it out loud sometimes, but I had been wanting this for a long time, yeah. and I've never done it. And I think that's sometimes what we all have to do when it comes to finding courage. It's not... Don't think about, am I brave enough to do the big thing that I want to do? Say, what is the smallest step that I'm willing to take? What's the smallest amount of fear that I can accept? And so all I thought was, well, if I have this person, I know I'll be able to, to live with her and she's going anyway and all that. I just, it, it's just, I can do that much. I can do that little bit. And then I got there and said, well, what am I going to do now? And I found out about film school. Okay, I can do that. And then I can do that. And I think it's that step by step. And I think sometimes we we sabotage ourselves by only thinking about that visible finish. Too big of a leap. All the courage it's going to take. Yeah. Instead, just say, what's the first step? What's the yeah. least I'm willing to do? And do that yeah. and see where you are. So what would you do when you got there? Um, Besides break up. <laughs> I found a place of my own in Hollywood. And, and I did. The very first Sunday I was in L.A., I saw an ad in the newspaper for a school called Sherwood Oaks Experimental College, and it was an uncredited film school, and I didn't need any credits. I had a master's degree in education. I didn't need any more degrees, and I didn't want to go through that kind of school anyway. But what it was was this great school where they would bring in working professionals in the film industry to give lectures and classes about what they did. And so I got to, first of all, I had a lot of big name people that came and spoke to the school. So I, you know, I heard all kinds of stars, Clint Eastwood and Sylvester Stallone and Ron Howard and Richard Dreyfuss and um, Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro and on and on and on. But also I found this class called story analysis, which is the formal term for reading scripts professionally and then giving your opinions to the, your boss. And I took that and I was good at it. So that's, that was my first job and that's developed into, that sort of led to where I am now. Yeah. So what, who impacted you the most at Sherwood Oaks? And you know, if you go to your LinkedIn profile at the very end, it says Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. And so I was definitely going to ask about that because <laughs> It, it looked, you know, you see the University of Oregon, you see Georgia, and then you see Sherwood Oaks Experimental College. It just looked out of place. Like, I didn't know what that was. And it didn't even sound like a film school because it actually, the founder of it had, previous to that, founded a real experimental school. It was like an experimental high school. Why would you call it an experimental college? It's such a weird name. It is. It, it, was, it was odd. Uh, and uh, the, well... If you ask, if you mean who in all of that experience had the biggest effect on my career, it would be a woman named Sarah Merrick who taught that class in learning to be a reader. I mean, she's not a famous person, yeah. uh, but she was a, a, a name a story analyst at uh, Fox, I think, at yeah. the time. But other than that, as far as the big name people... Um, I don't know if there was one. One of the neat things that happened there is after I'd been there a while and was known by the director and so on, he needed somebody to fill in to interview one of the stars that came. And so uh, the first time he asked me is there was an acting conference. They were having an, an actor, Richard Benjamin. I don't know if you know that was, but he was in Diary of a Mad Housewife and Portnoy's Complaint and Last of She was a big actor back in the 70s and eight, into the 80s. And I had seen all of his stuff and he said, would you be willing to interview him? And that was, that was one of my moments of greatest fear. I was just so nervous about doing that. And I remember I sat down with uh, Vicky, my wife, who wasn't my wife at the time. And I said, gee, I, I'm, I don't know if I can do this, but I've seen all of his movies and I know what I'd like to ask. And she right. said, 
she encouraged me to do it, so I did. And it went great, and so I started interviewing people. I got to interview Clint Eastwood, I got to interview Billy Wilder and Jack Lemmon and Ron Howard, mm -hmm. and that also contributed to me eventually getting in front of people and talking about screenwriting. So it was a cool thing. And the last thing I'll share about the film school is yep. that is uh, that's where I met my wife. We ah. met standing in line to see the movie Jaws as part of a class at the school. Really? So and she went to the same. She went to the experimental she, college. That's how we met. She was going to the same school. Uh, she's a pub, She was a publicist and has been a publicist for a long, long time. And it just is one of those fortuitous things. There was a class and, you know, talking to the different people involved with Jaws and you got to see the movie first. And we were standing in the line to see it and, and she was cute. And so I struck a conversation in a moment of boldness that I usually would never have. And, um, and now she's trying to keep our dog from barking. <laughs> so... There you go. Well, I mean, Jaws isn't the most romantic movie, so that's good that you you uh, ended up together. Oh, well, that was a good thing because she's the one who said, encouraged, she says, movies like this really scare me. Can I sit next uh, to you? I gotcha. And, and this was right after I'd gotten to L.A. and I thought, these Hollywood women, they're bold. I like that, you know. So she sat down next to me and I, I went and I said, I'm going to go get a coat. Do you want one? And she said... He said, oh, that's okay. I'll just have some of yours. <laughs> this is a complete stranger. This is said, perfect. Okay. So I got this gigantic Coke, you know, about one of those 10-gallon concession stand Cokes. And then I proceeded to spill it all over. <laughs> How could she not fall in love with me? So, it was it when Jaws jumped out? When? Why did you spill it all over? Um, uh, because... <laughs> I said it. I didn't have any place to sit it. They didn't. They didn't have cup holders in theaters then. So I set it on the arm of the chair in front of us. And I was so nervous about both watching the shark and sitting next to this beautiful woman that I started flipping the seat with my foot, and it knocked the thing in all <laughs> over. Her so I've always been a very smooth guy. That's smooth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. What was the difference, Michael, from interviewing Clint Eastwood versus Ron Howard when you had to interview uh, them? One of the one of the big differences was when I interviewed Clint Eastwood, he was a huge star. When I interviewed Ron Howard, he had just directed his first movie, which I think was uh, Gumball Rally or some car chase thing. And so Clint Eastwood, there were 300 people in the audience, and Ron Howard, there were about 20 mm. because it was well uh, – it was – let's see – it was after he'd left Happy Days, I guess, uh, and uh, before before A Beautiful Mind and before he became, you know, the Ron Howard, the really well-known director. So that was it. Otherwise, um, they, they were, I, I mean, I don't remember every answer they had, mm -hmm. but I remember both of them were great fun to interview, very thoughtful. Um, very generous with the information they were giving. I think that uh, Clint Eastwood was a bit surprising when he, t because he has this persona, this was some time ago, but he had this persona, you know, as a star and this, uh, you know, this action guy and this cowboy and so on. Right. And I asked him who influenced him or who he was, uh, you know, as an actor. And one of the people he said was Laurence Olivier, hmm. which I wouldn't have expected. Right. But, you know, it, it makes sense because toward the end of Laurence Olivier's career, that's when Clint Eastwood's was growing. So it was just a cool opportunity. Yeah. So who would you want to interview today? Gosh, <laughs> uh, who would I, that I haven't? I've gotten yeah. to interview some cool people. I got to interview Aaron Sorkin. That was wonderful. And Gary Ross and, and Terry Rossio and Ted Elliott. Because I've continued to do this from time oh, yeah. to time. Okay. Could. And uh, and so uh, those were all great fun. Who would I want to now? Um, probably I I have more fun interviewing uh, actors, mm -hmm. interestingly, than screenwriters. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of this. I know a lot about screenwriting. And so I'm having to ask questions that I think the audience would want to know that I kind of already know. And it's, it you don't want to be a know-it-all interviewer. You want to sort of recede, at right. least if you're a good one, in my opinion. 
Acting, though, I've never acted. I just still find it magical, and I'm very fascinated by how people would do that. So I probably enjoy interviewing somebody like Jennifer Lawrence, who I think is terrific, or, or Bradley Cooper, or, mm-hmm. or so you know, people who I think are just top of their game actors to see how they get to what they do. Mm-hmm. So, Michael, besides the Clint Eastwood answer, what other answers surprised you? from one of the, the people you interviewed? Anyone with, with this, Aaron Sorkin? Uh, um, well, uh, this isn't a specific answer that surprised me, but uh, and maybe this shouldn't have surprised me, but no matter how big the status of the person, yeah. they all were nervous about being interviewed. Really? I've done more recently as I sometimes do this, if there's a conference, I'll ask to do a certain kind of event where I will take a movie, I will analyze it as an example of a great script, and then I will, and in the audience will be the screenwriter. Mm. This, is what, this was what Aaron Sorkin did and, and uh, uh, Shane Black and the Pirates of the Caribbean, Shrek people. And then they come on stage and they can refute whatever I said about the analysis. Yeah. And more than once they would say, can't we just do a Q&A? They were very nervous about whatever I would say about their movies. And I only ever said nice things. It's not like you're criticizing it. You're just no, breaking it down. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm critiquing it in a very good way because I picked them because I thought these are, right. these are the best screenwriters working. And uh, so that, I found that interesting that it's, there's still that, um, that sort of difficulty in opening up, and especially for writers, I would think, because if you're a writer, part of the reason you want to be a writer is that contradictory situation of you very much want to be heard, but you don't really want to have to face people. <laughs> you like to work alone, yeah. and, you know, and by yourself. So then after Sherwood Oaks Experimental College, what was next? Well, then I started... Uh, making cold phone calls to try and get a job as a reader. All a reader is is somebody that uh, that someone in Hollywood, primarily agents and producers, and studios have them too. Let's say you're an agent in Hollywood. One of the things you're going to get is hundreds of of screenplays or letters or now emails from people saying, will you represent me? I want to break into Hollywood. Will you represent me? And then if if you look at those scripts, they're almost all horrid. Uh, I mean, the first job I had, the agent said, you're going to find 99 of 100 of these are awful. And I thought, gee, that's, you know, awfully cynical. And then I read 100 and figured out he was being generous uh, because, you know, people will just think they can do it because they've seen a movie and they don't really research or study or practice or whatever. So they don't want to take all their time doing that. So they'll pay a pittance to someone who will read it for them, write a one page summary of what it's about and give their comments Mm -hmm. and that's how I started out and that's how a lot of people who are screenwriters or executives or agents start out that's the entry level job and then and then one of the producers I was reading for promoted me and made me his head of development meaning I was now working with writers and finding ideas and that led to other jobs with other producers but as soon as I felt like I knew enough I don't I wanted to teach I had this master's in education where I used to teach little kids and I didn't want to do that but I really wanted to teach adults and so as soon as I thought I knew like two weeks worth of information more than my students would. I, I did a class at that very same experimental college, but then that led to a job at UCLA. And What was your class about? The very first one, it was called uh, uh, something like developing your screenplay. What the, the way I always approach it as a teacher, since I'm not a screenwriter, I've never been a screenwriter, I've always been on the receiving end is, the point of view is always, this is what I and everybody who has a job like me is looking for in a script. So let me show you what it is you need to do and how you can get to that, and that will improve your screenplays. So that's that's been the sort of basis of all my lecturing. And, um, and I started at that school, and then UCLA Extension hired me to go there. And out of that grew people asking me, could you look at my script? And there, while well, I became a, a consultant. It's another example, too, of what I was saying about that courageous thing. Most of the big moments and changes in my life have sort of just 
appeared. <laughs> You know, it wasn't like I thought, if I do this, then I can be a consultant. No, first of all, the job didn't exactly exist back right. then. I was one of the first, uh, along with a handful of other people. But it's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then I started, and a friend of mine said, well, you know, if people in L.A. are interested in this, probably people all, all over the country would be. Yeah. So I started taking seminars on the road. So it's, I've never, there's never been the grand plan. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the only rule has sort of been if I'm not having fun, then I've got to find something else. I've got to change it in some way. And if I stop having fun, take out the not fun things and, and substitute. And that that's worked well for me because I now I love what I do. So, Michael, what was a big turning point or milestone when you started getting into consulting? Are you still teaching at UCLA at the time and doing consulting, or do you? Do you... Um, I, I, it was UCLA Extension, so you know the extension program. So there was a while when I was still doing that and traveling around the country, and then I started getting paid, uh, or you know people would pay me to look at their scripts. So there was no. At the beginning, there was no big watershed moment. I mean, maybe the first time somebody asked me to do it was, but I don't even remember what that was. It just seemed like a logical thing. I also remember I charged so little to do it because I thought, you know, well, I was, I was young and I didn't need as much money. And it never occurred to me that people would really pay a decent amount of money. But then I caught on that they would. And so that, that grew. Um, the biggest... I would say the biggest turning points for me in my career would have been first when I first came to LA to do this because that was that was huge to just yeah. dream about it for 28 years or whatever it was 25 years and then finally come and then um, and then uh, the first time I did that interview of Richard Benjamin at the school and it's not a point but when my first job as a reader. And then, uh, and then more recently, getting the call from Will Smith, not just because it was cool, but because having worked with him looks really good on the resume, you know, I mean, it's, it's usually mentioned. And it was just such a wonderful, wonderful experience. I just love when I get to work with him yeah. on his projects. He's just wonderful and, and so on. So those are, those are yeah. some of the kind of big, big moments. Yeah. So, Michael, before you went to L.A., you said you didn't want to bring up kind of that you wanted to be in movies, was that more of a subconscious thing or a conscious that you didn't purposely tell anyone because you didn't want them to squash it? Well, I guess, it, I mean, I was aware I was doing it. So I guess on that regard, it was conscious, but it was also kind of automatic. It wasn't like every day I thought, it's today that I'm going to tell anybody. It's just, no, don't talk about this. Mm. So I think I didn't even want to really talk about it to myself, if you will. Yeah. I just... I always knew, boy, someday, someday I would love to have that. I, I mean, and it wasn't, it wasn't, part of it was sort of being starstruck and thinking, but what I really wanted to be, if I look back and think about it is, I didn't want to be in the movie business. I wanted to be in the movie. <laughs> oh, you want to I mean, be in the movie? Yeah. I mean, I, not as an actor. I mean, oh. I, what what movies are wonderful for and were for me it wasn't like i had an unhappy child or anything but you get to occupy a whole new world and it's a way of getting away from the life you're living and so it's like i want to it, it's almost like in a purple rose of cairo way i want to be in you know on the other side of that screen i want to be in that magical place yeah. all the time so it was not a formulated calculated career kind of thing it's yeah. just I want to be a part of that. Yeah. So what's been a screenplay that's come across your desk that you read and you immediately knew this is something? Because you said 99 out of 100 or whatever the, the ratio is, is not good. Yeah, I don't want this to sound mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know that I've ever had that experience. Really? And no, because when screenplays come to me, they, I mean, I've read screenplays for movies that already exist, but then I've already seen the movie most of the time, and I right. know it's good. Right. Okay, right. but I assume you're talking about somebody hires me. Yes. I I almost never think that would I and I and oh I hardly ever think this 
has no mer merit at all. This is just terrible. I mean, sometimes it's it's pretty has a lot of <laughs> issues. Let's say a lot of problems because I'm sure they appreciate that honesty, though. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. You got to be honest. I mean, it, they they don't all appreciate it. I mean, every once in a while, I I get the sense someone's paying me because they really want me to just tell them how good they are and reinforce. You know, and and those are always the worst scripts or the the people who come in saying, "Oh, this only needs a little tweaking," you know, and it, it needs any changes at all. Then I know that's going to be terrible. But what when I get a script, it's always. I'm going to immerse myself in the story, but always with an eye to how can this be better? How can, how can, how can this be stronger? How can the emotion be greater? How can the meaning, how can the theme be deeper or come across or all those things that I'm thinking about and experiencing. So I don't, I, I mean, it's just never happened that I thought, oh, this is great. I, I sometimes say, well, this has a lot of possibilities, or right. this is a good concept, or this is quite good already, yeah. and especially if I'm getting scripts from studios. Yeah. But even with that, okay, yeah, I see that this was professionally done, and, and that might mean that it's better written than most, but I'm looking for how can it be even better? Mm -hmm. So I don't really have that experience. I'm surprised at that. I thought there'd be one or two that stick out that – above the rest yeah I, I i hate the thought that everybody i've ever you know <laughs> consulted with is going to say well you know i thought you liked my script and it's not that it's not about not right. liking it. it's just that you know but i don't remember having that i mean i'm even talking about because i got i am legend when it was almost finished right. i got and a movie i liked even more of wills which was um, uh hancock and, but but that wasn't what I was supposed to be focusing on. And I was always like, how am I reacting to this? Am I feeling what I need to be feeling? How can this be better? Mm -hmm. So certainly I read those scripts and thought, well, I see why this movie is getting made. Yeah. But I didn't think, oh, wow, I don't need to contribute anything to mm -hmm. this. Right. I couldn't allow myself to say that. Anyway. A lot of room for improvement. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what's some of the most common mistakes people make when they're telling this story? Well, the um, first of all, there's the basics. The basics are they don't have a clear hero to the story. It's just about an event. Um, this would be uh, when I work with public speakers and things, there might be someone who's telling a story about Gettysburg, okay, or for instance, or and and it'll be about the battle and it'll be about this many people were killed and this happened and there's no no hero. So it's just facts and it's just maybe it paints a picture of the locale, but that doesn't work. There's no hero, even more common, there's no goal. There's nothing for us to root for. It's just the hero is in a situation, situation is filled with conflict, they're struggling, maybe they can overcome it. Um, and then at the end they do and isn't that magical. And that can work. I mean, it's not that that's devoid of value, but it is to me, it has room for so much improvement and can be so much more powerful if they can give that character a real clear objective so that we are carried on the journey as we root for that person, hope they'll end. It'd be, imagine going to attract me. OK, right. and you have you gather together a lot of fast runners and you say, go. And they all run fast until they finally are done. <laughs> they but force so gump. They just run out of the stadium. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But they just keep you're still seeing somebody who's a great athlete. You're still seeing them running very fast. You can even time them and say this person was going this much. Okay. But if you don't have a finish line, you're really going to go to that track meet. I don't think so. And it's the same in a story. We want to know where do we want this person to be. And then the, uh, the flip side of that, or not flip side, but the added thing is no conflict. They think that the story should be this person wanted this and they did this and this is great that they did this and they were courageous here and they did this skill thing here and then they got it. Isn't that wonderful? And it may be wonderful and it may be instructive to say you should do this too, but if they're not overcoming conflict in learning to do what you're trying to get your audience to do mm -hmm. not going to be as emotionally involving then beyond those basic things i would say the next thing is um they make the story too complicated i i have 
I, I could probably in my whole career count on one or two hands the number of scripts I've read where at some point I didn't say, you're making this too complicated. And I have never, to my knowledge, in my entire career, ever heard somebody's story or read a screenplay or read a novel and said, this is too simple. Mm -hmm. It just never happened. That's happens. really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It surprised me when I realized that, too, because you'd think the opposite. You'd think, well, they haven't come up with enough. I think it's because, oftentimes, they haven't zeroed in on what is that core hero desire and conflict then they get into the story and they realize this is kind of static. We're kind of stuck here in this place. I better have something new happen. So they'll bring in some tangential event or some more characters, or they'll start telling about another thing the character did, and now we're all over the map. That's what I mean by complicated. Right. Simple, simple, simple is better always, always. And... And then if it's if it's so if it, if it's so simple and clear that it can be done in less time than you're allotted, then tell two stories, <laughs> or or find a different one. But um, it's it's so counterintuitive to go simple with a story because you think it I've is got, counterintuitive. Yeah. 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 Well, if you're standing in front of a of an audience, let's say, and you have to tell a story. You think, I got to squeeze in a lot of stuff or it's not going to be interesting. And interesting is never what it's about. Yeah. People don't go to hear interesting stories. They go to hear emotional stories. Right. And it's if you want to add more to it, don't make it more complicated. Make it deeper. Go deeper into the character. Get more in touch with what their inner fears are. More in touch with what their backstory is that got them there. Mm -hmm. So that's a hugely common uh, weakness of stories. Mm. And uh, then beyond that, I think we get into more of this, I, I don't know if you'd say sophisticated, but sort of a new level of storytelling. Um, and that brings in things like when you're telling a story in whatever context, whether you're a novelist or a speaker or, or writing email, promotional emails, you, you've got to create a movie in the mind of your reader or your audience. Doesn't matter if you're a movie writer or not. It's still we all yeah. when we hear stories, we're really projecting a movie Visual. inside our head. Yeah. And so, what you need to then do is be more vivid in describing the setting and the character and and what they're wearing. Or if it's an autobiographical story, you might say the smells were like this, or I heard this, or the environment was this, and and whatever the setting is, it'll reflect the character in some way. And then, um, and then, uh, along with vividness of description, is dialogue. Um, that's something. And screenwriters often put too much dialogue in their scripts. Public speakers often put too little or none at all. Mm -hmm. Where sometimes it's much more effective to just go into the voice of the person or one of the characters in the story. Mm -hmm. Do you find? I know in your book, and people should check out The Hero's Two Journeys because you do a great job kind of laying out. Do you find in speeches there should be a certain format with conflict and, you know, and, and some of the kind of similar to how the, the, the screenwriter should, should do? Yeah, uh, I do. It's not quite as rigid as what you're talking about. You're talking about a lecture that I gave where I lay out my approach to screenplay structure, right. where it also applies by and large to novels, yeah. which is to divide a story into six stages right. and take the character through those stages as they pursue this goal. Right. You do that same structure really applies to any story, but you don't need to divide it into six because sometimes a story say from a stage or in an email is much shorter and it's a little too rigid to apply that but there is a basic sequence you want to follow when you tell a story and so it has its own structure that parallels that one yeah. and and for for telling a story let's say or for what a shorter one you might write in a marketing email or something like that or even if you're writing an article sometimes you know executives in fact i was asked to do that, write it, i didn't so much tell a story as give some of these principles to an entrepreneurial magazine but 
you're asked to write a story for, uh, let's say, a business publication or something in your arena of the arena of your career yeah. on how you got your start or the most influential person I ever met or the big breakthrough, the kind of questions you like to ask that I, that I don't have good answers to. And so you're going to write that. You still want to develop that story in a certain sequence. And that is, first of all, what I call a setup. You always want to introduce your hero living her everyday life before the story kicks into gear. Don't, don't, you don't want to have your audience or your reader have to jump on a train that's already left the station. You want to start in a static way, actually. You want to start, this is who I was before, the, or this is who this character was before they began this journey. This is the life they were living. This is the life they've been living for some time. And in that next rule is in that everyday setting or their everyday life, you want to create that empathy. You want to get us to connect emotionally with that character. So to do that, you either get us to feel sorry for the character, make them a victim in some way. You put them in jeopardy. They're about to lose a job or a loved one or whatever. Or, and you can do all three of these if you want, you make them a good, generous, kind person so they're likable. And then after you've established that character in that everyday life, then you present them with the opportunity that's going to move them into a new situation and get the story going. And in that new situation, then they'll decide, okay, this is what I want. I want to make the $10,000. I want, I, I want to run in the marathon in spite of the fact that I um, just lost my leg in an accident. I actually coached someone who wrote their autobiography that was about wow. skier, but same thing. They yeah. had cancer, they lost a leg, and they wanted Jeez. to go back to skiing anyway. Wow. So it was so the opportunity was the diagnosis, and now they're gonna and so they went through the surgery, and then they decided, okay, I don't care if I'm now an amputee, I'm gonna I'm gonna enter this race, mm -hmm. and that was what the story was about, and then. After you do those things, the setup, the opportunity, the new situation and the goal, now you just sequence your obstacles so that the hero has to overcome that series of obstacles. And then the last two things are the climax. That's the moment when the hero wins or gets the goal, if the hero does. And most of the time you'll tell stories where the hero does win. And then the last thing is you have to follow that with the aftermath. In other words, you never want your story to just end when the hero wins. You always want to show the new life that character is living because they've completed this journey. Mm -hmm. So if you just do that, that's basically the structure of any story. Yeah. Just If you just tell your story in that sequence, actually, if you tell your story in that sequence, you're going to be better than 90% of the people telling stories. because yeah. it, And it's really not, you know, it's not rocket surgery, as somebody said once, you know. <laughs> Fairly simple and straightforward. It's just, it's just not something we all think about because everybody doesn't watch a hundred movies a year like I do, you know, and pick them apart. So, so, Michael, what is a movie that breaks the rules? Like, it's good to study, obviously, the ones that kind of follow the structure. What's a successful movie that breaks rules that you like to reference or think about? Yeah, you, you sent me some of these questions in advance so I could think about them, and that's a tough one I because I think because I present the rules so rigidly, I don't yeah. like to admit that some do, and then I realized the best answer to that question is all of them break the rules mm -hmm. because any really good work of art is going to break the rules in some way. If It's, it's never going to be absolutely right. rigid. They're going to be flexible with where the turning points occur. They're going to create, like if you took look at a lot of Martin Scorsese's movies, um, it's very hard to empathize with those heroes at the beginning. Very hard to, with Jake LaMotta or with uh, uh, Travis Bickle, maybe a little easier with him because he's sort of a victim. And, and uh, I don't remember the name of the Ray Liotta character in... Um, are you talking yeah. about Goodfellas or which one? Goodfellas, yeah. Goodfellas, yeah. You know, Goodfellas opens with a hero gunning a guy in a trunk of a car. That's right. hard to empathize with. So it breaks those. Or or you might have uh, 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 Sleepless in Seattle, one of my all-time favorite movies. 
says, "We're going to. I'm going to show you a love story, and the two people are never going to meet until the last scene in the movie. That you can't do that. In fact, he tried to sell that as a pitch, and nobody would buy it. They all said, "This is a great idea. We can't make this movie. Nobody's going to go see a movie like that." So he wrote it as a spec script. He wrote the entire script, and then he sold it for a lot of money, and he got an Oscar nomination out of it. So, so it's my contention is it's not about breaking or not breaking the rules. Mm. It's the people who break the rules well know what the rules are so well right. that they're conscious of breaking them. What bothers me or what I think is the wrong attitude is, well, I saw Quentin Tarantino's movie, you know, Pulp Fiction, and it didn't follow the rules, so I'm not going to worry about rules. I don't want to be restricted. And then you just get a mess. Believe yeah. me, Quentin Tarantino knows movies. He's, he's seen way more movies than I have, and he knows structure inside and out, so he right. knows how he's varying it. Right. So that wasn't quite what you were No, that is, that is kind of what I'm That's, getting at, is when, you, you know, people know the rules or they know the fundamentals, then they know how they can break them. You know what I mean? So that was kind of what I was trying yeah. to to understand a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. And, and you also need to understand that when you say rules, there's a lot of, if you want to call them rules, there's a lot of principles that appear in every successful story, every successful movie. Yeah. But there are so many. What you can't do is you can't break them all. Then, then you have an experimental film or something. Then you're, you, you know, it's it's one of those movies like Andy Warhol's game made back in the 60s, you know, where you just watch somebody sleeping. You can't do that. Okay. You, you know all the principles and then you pick and choose the ones. I'm going to I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to I'm going to, you know, um, Birdman would be a recent uh, example just in the way it, it follows a lot of the rules, it's still a clear goal he wants to put on the play, but doing it all in like one continuous shot, that's that's not something most movies do. And and the ending is awfully ambiguous. That's really not something you want to do and so on. But they do. Mm -hmm. And I liked it. I thought it was good. So, Michael, since it's inspired Insider, I always ask the question, what's the lowest point in your life is and you had an interesting answer, which brings up a question, which is, it's like, I don't have any good stories for this one. And so that makes me think, because this does happen. And what do I do when someone doesn't have a low point story or they feel like they haven't had a lot of adversity? What do you, what do you, so like if someone's writing like an email or they're telling their story, they're a founder of a company and they're trying to kind of get the story out and they don't have that low point or adversity what? Uh, well, first of all, I'd say there's a difference between a low point and adversity. A low point to me is just when you've thrown in the towel and everything seems like it's going against you. Mm -hmm. And there are stories like that. Yeah. But if you if you think about, let's say, most movies, most movies are not about somebody who's at an absolute low point. It's just someone who is struggling with, is either in a static place, they're just sort of stuck, or they're str struggling with one particular challenge. The adversity is simply the hurdles and obstacles they have to overcome in achieving whatever goal they decide to pursue. pursue. So um, I think that if, if I were coaching someone and they said that, they said, I don't have any, in fact, I had a client who said that just this week. They said, I don't really get this conflict thing because I've never been destitute and I've never been an alcoholic right. and I never was in a horrible accident and so on and so on. And I said, most of the characters in most stories aren't. I said, that's not what's important. What's important is what did you want to do? And were there no obstacles? And I defy anybody, anybody to say they wanted something that a, was of real value to them and they had to, they were not, nothing stood between them and that goal. Because I just think if it, if it was that easy to get it, it probably really wasn't that important to them. The really, the really important things, the, the life-changing things elevate us or take us into a new place that challenges us, at least internally, and forces us to confront some fears. So that's the way to look at it. Forget the low point. Mm -hmm. and instead, 
where were you right before you decided you wanted to do this? Mm -hmm. Why did you want to do it? Something was not satisfying to you. You either maybe you had a decent amount of money, but you wanted a lot of money. Maybe you had, you know, maybe you you were, had a happy marriage, but you wanted children or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So figure out first again if you're the hero of your own story, what's the goal you're going to tell us about? Tell me then, or tell us then, where were you right before you decided you were going to go after that? Wherever that was, it may not have been a low point in your life, but it was certainly a point in your life where you were unsatisfied about something. Mm -hmm. or, or it was a point in your life where you thought everything was fine, and then some opportunity was presented to you that you never dreamed of, and you decided, wait, i got to go for that. All of a sudden, this wish has been presented to me. I've got a chance to travel around the world if I only do X, and that's what the story is about. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I would look at it is start with what you wanted and then say what stood between me and that. Mm -hmm. So maybe more unsatisfied than low point? Um, yeah, and maybe it was my misinterpretation of the question because when you said low point to me I translated that to mean what that client of mine thought destitute and just on the skid you know just everything had fallen apart but maybe you didn't mean that by low point maybe you just mean you weren't as happy as you are now in some way right. so I what I'm saying is either don't interpret it the way I did, or if you do, don't feel like that's a necessity to tell a good story. Right, right. Because I and and the fact is, the reason I said I don't really have any good stories because I can't remember a time in my life when I hit bottom. If you know what I mean, yeah. I I've always been a pretty happy person. Actually, I've always been a very happy person, I believe, and so I've had struggles like everybody has and there have been challenges and there have been you know times of depression and times of of fear and worry but never not those not those movie of the week stories mm -hmm. you know, not, not those stories uh, about people yeah. who I, I lost everything and right. somehow came back right I guess it depends who you're comparing yourself to and I was just, I just ask it not comparing yourself to anyone just your personal but yeah, if you compare yourself to like an alcoholic who's living in an alley, then you think, yeah, I haven't really had a low point, or you know. Yeah, and you hear though you hear those like Tony Robbins, who's just a fantastic speaker, uh, I think. Um, but he tells about he was very very poor when he grew up. He tells right. about people bringing and giving them food at Thanksgiving. Right. They couldn't yeah. afford food. Uh, we didn't. Nobody. Nobody did that for me, you know, and so I know there is a cachet to that. If you've had that kind of experience, of course, tell it. But don't decide I can't be a storyteller because I've never been destitute. That mm -hmm. would be a mistake, I think. Yeah. yeah. And or, or the other thing you could do is just make it up. <laughs> tell people you were destitute even if you weren't. You think that's what it needs. What difference does it make, you know? All it, all it matters is that what but that what you're conveying to your audience is true. The facts don't have to be. So as long as you're not as long as you're not bilking them out of money or something, make stuff up. So on the on the flip side of that, I've always wondered this, and I thought you'd be a good person to ask: is how do you get people to open up and be more vulnerable to fully share their story? Like if you have someone you're working with and you know there's a story there, but they're not fully telling it or being vulnerable about it? Is there a way that you bring that out in them? There's a way that there are ways that I try, but that's, that's a tough one because I, because really good stories do come from a place of vulnerability and you do have to get in touch. There's a question I ask fairly frequently of clients who are writing screenplays, uh, especially when I can't get quite a handle on what the story is really about on a deeper level, and I'll ask them, where are you in this story? And I say, I don't mean which character are you. I'm not saying you are the, you are the cop in the story or you are the teenage boy or whatever it is. I mean, where 
is what is it in this story that's reflective of you, of your beliefs, of your fears, of what you're struggling with? Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy question to answer, but it is a question worth exploring mm -hmm. because if the client is willing to just play around in that sandbox for a while, then we can start to recognize that maybe there's a reason they're telling the story that they haven't really wanted to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. But it's only by figuring that out and being willing to kind of bear their soul within the story that it's going to reach a level of artistry that I think it needs to or that they want it to. Uh, it's... It's very important, and it is something that I'm very aware of coaching people, but it is one of the tough things about writing and being a storyteller. And by the way, that doesn't, I, I use screenwriters as an example because, you know, I've had that experience a lot with them, but it's the same if you're a public speaker. I mean, if yeah. the, the hardest thing about public speaking is not fear of being on the stage. You think that's it, and at first that might be it. But the hardest thing about being a public speaker is standing every, in front of everybody and getting naked in a certain way, of really being yourself mm -hmm. and sharing a pain that you have gone through or that you're still struggling with. It might mm -hmm. be more likely in your past that you've managed to get through, but that's hard. It's yeah. hard to step out of our emotional armor and really share our truth. But those are the those are the speeches and those are the stories that are right. most powerful. Yeah. And you know that and when you're coaching someone, how do you get them to like when you read, let's say they're doing a speech and you go, you're thinking they haven't really gotten naked in this. How do you, is there a specific example, not that you have to name names, but how you got them to actually get on stage and do that? It's not quite like you're, saying it's not like okay come on you gotta you gotta be courageous you gotta get up on stage and doing that more than that i think it's pointing out to them what the gaps are in the story or suggesting that what they're really getting at is something deeper mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um i i coached somebody just this week who a new client who's a public speaker and wanted my feedback on a story now it wasn't that this person wasn't willing to share or say something about himself that was fairly raw, but it was more, but it was more asking those questions and getting at, but but what really happened then? What were you really feeling? What really made you change? It's one of the things I say a lot, not a lot, but one of the things I say often to speakers is, audiences don't don't just want to know that you changed. Okay, stories about heroes who change are fine, but if all you're going to say is, and then this character was courageous and they changed, that does me no good. I know I'm supposed to be more courageous. What we want to know is how. And so the key to the story is not that they, that they had the moment of courage. It's what happened right before that. Mm -hmm. How did they find that courage? What was the new way of looking at the world? What was the new thought? What was the piece of wisdom or advice they were given? What was the realization they had that they finally realized that the pain of not doing something was worse than the, the, than the anticipated pain of doing this scary thing. That's, that's the kind of linchpin of the story when it comes to that transformative kind of story. So it's, it's not about pushing a client that's going on the stage into doing something they don't want to do. It's more like, let's see what's really going on in this story you tell. And, and in my experience, most of the time when we finally get to what's really going on and they realize it, they don't back out. Then they, they want to share that. Mm -hmm. And they want to be more open. Yeah. yeah. It wouldn't always be. I mean, sometimes, and, and occasionally it's not. And then I think the issue is maybe it's not time to tell this story yet. Maybe it's still too raw. Mm -hmm. I don't think you want to process your problems on stage. I right. think you need to wait a little bit until you work something through, and then you can share it with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the stage is a <laughs> it's not the best therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it could be, but I don't think that's what the audience wants to do. It's trial by fire. Um, yeah. 
So on the flip side of the the low moment, uh, what's been one of the proudest moments for you? Um, a moment that was totally my own at first was when I wrote my first book and the first copy arrived in the mail. Mm. Because that first book took me like five years to write. Uh, the way I usually put it, it was a, it was a five-year journey. It was six months of writing and four and a half years of block. Because <laughs> it was so hard. I mean, my writer's block was so strong. And it was just like getting, getting to the computer to do that and postponing and procrastinating and so on. And when I finally saw it in not the galleys or any of that. This was the, the book that was going to be in bookstores. There was a moment of real, di very difficult to describe satisfaction that ran very deep. It was like, you know, you did this. And it, it's kind of this realization, no matter what else happens, or if nothing else happens in your life, you did this. And that meant a lot to me. That meant a lot to me. And then it's not maybe it's not quite as proud, but there's also a very exciting moment that follows that. And that's the first time you see your book in a bookstore that you're not there doing a signing, but you're just, you know, I would randomly go in a bookstore in Detroit because I was lecturing there and there'd be my book. And that was sort of cool. But the, but the moment of real pride was when I, I finished that and, and got to see the first copy. Was that writing screenplays that sell? No, Is that screenplays that sell. Yeah. And this is this is is this about the twentieth anniversary of the book? Yeah, it's, it's actually gone. The I did a new edition. The Harper Collins wanted me to mm. do a new edition when it was a twentieth anniversary. So I updated everything and used all new example, well, a lot of new examples and updated things and a few things that I had a different perspective on than I had twenty years ago. But it's been now almost. Maybe it has been 25, I think, since mm -hmm. it was actually published. And it's still, I, I still, uh, I still really am pleased with that book. It's still, even though, you know, movies have changed in a lot of ways in terms of the of the industry. You know, there's all the new cable, and the, I mean, when I first wrote that book, there was no such thing as the internet, and there was no such thing as all that. That's wild to think about. Yeah, fact, I wrote that book. I wrote, I, I think I actually wrote that book on a computer, but it was like a K Pro is the first computer I ever had. You know, one of these little things that had about, you know, one kilobyte. Right. Of right. That. But anyway, all that's changed. But when it comes to Hollywood storytelling, it hasn't really changed much at all. In fact, I don't know that it's changed at all. The only differences would be in the way I looked at things and maybe making them a little clearer, more simple for people who want to break in. But uh, otherwise, so I'm still very, very happy with that. Yeah. So is the new one going to be on Audible? Is the new one, the new version, uh, writing screenplays that sell the new edition? Uh, not that. Uh, not that. Oh. Do you know something I don't know? No, no, no nobody's ever said anything about that. Oh. Um, I think that, and I've never pushed it because I do have a lot of material that people can listen to. That's yeah. on like Heroes Two Journeys. That's more recent thinking than is in that mm -hmm. book, and so on. I, I do have, uh, although it may end up being another five years, but uh, there is uh, another book that I want to be writing. Which and, is are you allowed to talk about? Well, oh. well, I, I. That book does not include either my – it doesn't include the things that are in the Heroes 2 Journeys, the lecture, the DVD, and the CD. and mm -hmm. the, it, That's now you can video stream that as well, mm -hmm. the Heroes 2 Journeys. But that's not in book form. And, and nor mm, – I got gotcha. you. What I would – what my next book needs to be is about – that six-stage structure and especially the things about the inner journey, what we've been talking about in terms of identity and essence and transformative material. And I would want the new book to be broader in its scope in that when I give these principles, it's not just for screenwriters, mm -hmm. but it would apply. It would, I mean, it applies to everyone, but it's really was designed for screenwriters. And so someone who's a storyteller on stage they can extract helpful material, but yeah. it, 
but nothing speaks directly to that. Yeah. The next book I write is going to be, this is how stories work. And if you're in this situation, it applies this way. And if you're a marketer, it's this way. And if you're an attorney, it's this way. And so on. Yeah. Yeah. So, Michael, I've, this has been fantastic. I have one last question. Thank you so much. Before I ask it, tell people where they should check out more uh, from you. What are you working on lately? Okay. Well, the uh, the the main places go to my website because you'll hear you'll see more about me than you ever wanted to know. But mostly, there's just an abundance of articles I've written and questions and answers. And there are some short tips, things I call misdemeanors, which are the things you shouldn't do when you're writing a script or tell a story yeah. and so on. And then also, anyone who's interested in working with me on their story as a consultant or for me to coach them on their story, whether it's a story for a speech or a presentation in a corporate arena or it's a written story or anyone who's listening and wants to be a screenwriter is a screenwriter. If you go to the website, it tells all about my coaching process and you can sign up there and it has all of the products we've talked about the books and 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 so on and the website is storymastery.com yeah we'll link that up yeah that would be great i'd appreciate yeah. that but it's but apart from the coaching and the the uh, products the things you pay money for i just wanted to be a real good resource and there is an abundance well you abundance. know abundance oh yeah out in there and there's there's a lot of articles about different aspects of storytelling uh you know and and reference to movies and at the very least if nothing else i think it'll change the way you look at movies yeah it for sure will yeah, yeah. that that's it you said what's one of the one of the things i always enjoy as much as anything when i lecture to groups um novelists screenwriters whatever is when people come up and say to me i'll never look at movies the same way again <laughs> it always kind of excites me it's like that's cool because they don't they aren't mad it's like i never thought about this and i can appreciate that more right. and to me it's it's kind of like that is more than anything being close to what that kid i was talking about who was five years old in the movie theater it's like i'm now i'm now directly connecting a movie goer with what I love in a way that they can get more involved. And, yeah. and that's just cool to me. That's yeah. just, uh, that's, that's kind of, I think, in a way, what I dreamed of way back then when it wasn't even formulated as a full dream. Yeah. So my last question, Michael, is just, you know, we've talked a lot. What's something we should leave people with to close on? I, I don't know, picnic basket? <laughs> <laughs> I, that's it. That's it. What should we leave? Any, any final words, any things that, you know, we talked a lot about different things, any final kind of something well, that see, people should. Some things we've touched. I mean, we've talked about when you tell a story, focus on character, desire, and conflict. And we talked about um, getting that. I'll, I'll, let's see. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say one last thing. I, I often say this when I'm lecturing. And that is, when you think about it, almost everything I've talked about in terms of story is true for real life. And when we were talking about identity, one of the ways, identity being the emotional armor, the persona, if you like the Jungian term for it, you know, that, that false self we present to the world. And if you're watching a movie and you want to figure out what is a character's real inner conflict, then ask yourself, how would this character fill in the blank in this sentence? Okay, and the sentence is, I'll do whatever it takes to achieve my goal. Just don't ask me to blank, because that's just not me. So for Will Hunting, who we talked about with Good Will Hunting, he'll do whatever it takes to win the love of Skylar, the mini driver character. Just don't ask me to let anyone in and see who I truly am because that's just not me, right. okay? So what I leave people with is one of the most powerful things you can do is ask yourself, how would you fill in that blank? So think about first, what's your goal? Get very specific of what your next thing, what your next finish line you wanna cross in your career, in your personal life or whatever it is. So you really know this is what I want and then say, just write it out. I'll do whatever it takes to 
achieve that goal. Just don't ask me to blank because that's just not me. Yeah. And whatever you put in the blank that isn't you is the thing that scares you. Yeah. And then you just ask yourself, what is the smallest step I could take toward doing that thing? And then keep asking, what's the next step, next step? Because that's the thing that is most standing in the way of you getting that thing that you want. And that's the thing that if you confront it, you can really transform. Yeah. Michael, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, me too. Me too. Those were great questions. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you too. All right. Bye-bye.